All right. Welcome back to another episode of Revealed Apologetics. I'm your host, Eli Ayala, and um, I am, again, excited to have uh, Jason Lyle on uh, the show to talk about the historical Adam. So if you've seen the YouTube uh, thumbnail, you know that's the topic that we're going to be covering. A uh, very important and very controversial uh, topic. So definitely looking forward to uh, to inviting him on in just a few moments. Just real quick by way of announcement, I know folks are... Um, when they follow this channel, they're kind of up on the whole presuppositional apologetics and the methodological debates. Um, we got a real treat for you. Um, on November 23rd, I, I'm going to be having Joshua Pillows and David Pullman, who is a very outspoken critic of presuppositionalism. I'm going to be having those two gentlemen on the show um, to uh, discuss the the ins and outs of um, apologetic methodology from a presuppositional perspective, uh, which Joshua Pillows um, holds that perspective, and David Pullman representing the um, evidentialist perspective. So, so that's going to be a very exciting, I'm sure, very lively, but very respectful uh, interaction. So uh, please stay tuned for that. That's on the 23rd at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, all right. Well, um, just to give folks a heads up, we're going to be talking about the historical Adam and more specifically, I mean, not too specifically, but the ideas of uh, Dr. Craig's book. And we're going to be talking about the book directly. Um, you could know what Dr. Craig's position is. Uh, that's reflected in this book by reading some of his articles, listening to some podcasts. Um, if you have a good background on the topic, you can kind of generally know where he's coming from. Um, I've read portions of the book, so I'm not speaking from a place of authority uh, in this area, but definitely Dr. Lyle is someone who is very knowledgeable in the uh, area of Genesis, uh, the historical Adam. And so I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing what he has to say. And hopefully this conversation is going to be uh, a blessing. Uh, it's going to be edifying to those who are interested in this topic and um, hopefully it will be challenging for folks. So really think about these things. We're talking about the story of Adam and Eve. We're talking about the Bible. The issues of biblical authority come up um, and uh, biblical interpretation. So there's a wide range of topics that are involved in these sorts of conversations. All right. So um, hopefully uh, you guys will enjoy. I know I'm going to be blessed. I always uh, love having Dr. Lyle on. He's such a, a, a clear and, and good speaker and really knows his stuff. And so um Looking forward to, to having them on in just a few seconds. If you have not um, subscribed to Revealed Apologetics, please do so. Hit the notification bell so that you know upcoming videos that are going to be coming up. I will also be moderating a debate between a presuppositionalist, haven't announced his name yet, and an atheist. Um, so um, that should be a really great opportunity to see presuppositional apologetics in practice. So I'll let you guys know when that's going down as well. All right. Well, without further ado, we got a little crowd going. And um, thank you so much for your... Um, uh, your support. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Lyle on the screen with me. How are you doing, Dr. Lyle? I'm very good. How are you? I'm doing well. I've been busy, but you've been busy as well. I, um, I look tired and you're really good at hiding being tired. So <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> why don't you take a few moments and let folks know what you've been up to uh, before we jump into our topic? Okay. Well, I've been really on the speaking circuit for the last month. I've done, I've been, I feel like I've been everywhere in the last month. I was up in, uh, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, doing a bunch of speaking engagements, defending Genesis, defending the Christian faith presuppositionally. And then uh, and then just uh, last week I was in uh, Washington State and then California and then back to Washington State. And uh, it, I met some just wonderful brothers in, in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. It was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Washington State, California, interesting, but I'm glad to be back in America. <laughs> mm. Oh, very good. Um, well, I haven't been traveling. I'm just teaching and I have three kids and my wife is amazing. She helps out so much while I uh, crawl into my bed exhausted at the end of the day. So <laughs> so you look really good when you're busy. You look like you got it all together. That's really good. You got to yeah. tell me your secret. Uh, for, for me, it's coffee. And Jesus, not in that order. So, all right. Well, um, let's let's jump right into our, our topic. We're going to be talking about the historical Adam. Let, let's just start with a very generic but very uh, straightforward question. Why is the historical Adam, the question of the historical Adam, so important and foundational to the Christian faith? Well, if you think about the Christian Christian theology, how much of it is linked to Adam, the connection between uh, the the first Adam and Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Jesus is called the last Adam because of the connection. Uh, Adam brings sin into the world, sin and death, passes that on to us. Jesus Christ is the one who then alleviates that, that problem through mm. by, by paying our, our penalty, by dying on the cross 
for us. So that's certainly a big issue. The fact that Christian theology is linked back, not just to Adam, but to a, a literal reading of Genesis. And um, I think two other issues that that come into play here are if, if Adam's uh, not the way he's described in Genesis, if Genesis is myth or mytho-history, um, if, if we can't trust the details in Genesis, then we have mm -hmm. some theological issues because one of the things that we learn in Genesis is that death is the penalty for sin. It was introduced when Adam sinned. That brought suffering into, into a world that was originally very good, originally by God, God's own standard, very good. And so uh, death being the penalty for sin, now, of course, that's reiterated throughout the scriptures, but it has its origin. It has its foundation in the book of Genesis. So that's very, really very, very important. The whole idea of original sin and the fact that we need we need help. Even we, we can't even declare Jesus as Lord without the help of the Holy Spirit, as the Bible teaches. So we need that change of our nature. And then the other issue, too, is one of, of perspicuity, because, uh, you know, it's it's easy enough to debate against people who you say, well, the Bible's not inerrant and so on. But there are people who say the Bible's, the Bible's inerrant. I just don't read it like you do it. That's not that's not how I interpret that passage. And when you take something that really is as clear as Genesis and say, well, it's not clear. It could mean this, that or the other. Mm -hmm. That really is a subtle attack on the perspicuity, the clarity of Scripture. God is a linguistic being. He spoke the universe into existence. He created Adam able to speak. And for that reason, God does know how to communicate mm -hmm. uh, the issue. And, and granted, I realize there are difficult sections of Scripture. The Bible itself says that. Right. But nonetheless, the main and, and plain teachings of Scripture are pretty clear. And if we can't trust that, that calls into question God's omnipotence. Is he really able to communicate to us clearly? And right. so it brings into this issue of is the Bible really meant to be understood? Is it something that we need a Ph.D. in philosophy to understand or is it something that everybody if they do their homework, uh, can understand. And I, mm -hmm. and I take the latter. I take that the Bible is the clear word of God. Okay. Now, um, of course, there are people who will disagree with your interpretation, right? Um, and they'll they'll believe the Bible is the word of God. They'll believe it speaks clearly, but we need to identify genre, things like this. Why is it, um, is, why is it the case that this is an issue in terms of um, these different interpretations? I mean, you come to Genesis and you say, this is clearly historical narrative. Um, then you have other people who, um, um, yeah, you do have people who are influenced by science and kind of the external factors, but you do have people who are like, I think there's something else going on in the text here. Um, how would you kind of address those sorts of folks who think the Bible is the word of God? I believe in the authority of the word of God, but the issue is who is using the correct interpretive um, model here? How would you how would you speak to that issue? Well, first, I would want to make sure that um, I would want to uh, sort of analyze that individual and, and, and analyze for evidence of a sort of a postmodernist way of thinking, because many people think that they have the right to interpret the Bible any way that they wish, that there are multiple interpretations. And the way I like to say this to people is there are an infinite number of interpretations of the Bible. There's only one meaning. Mm -hmm. The author had a particular thing in mind that he wanted to convey and so although there are an infinite number of interpretations, because you can interpret text any way that you like, only one of them matches the meaning of the text. There's only one correct interpretation. Now, in some cases, it might be difficult to get to that correct interpretation. I don't deny that. Again, there are difficult sections in Scripture, and yeah. most of us read a translation of Scripture anyway. And so sometimes we have to do our homework and go back to the original uh, languages and do a little work there. And that, that can be tricky. But I would affirm that the main and plain doctrines of Scripture are clear, and I would affirm that you do not have the right to, re to interpret the Bible according to your preferences. I would argue that the Bible itself uh, gives us the rules of interpretation for mm -hmm. how it should be interpreted. And in fact, that was my motivation, if you don't mind a little shameless promotion. That was my uh, motivation okay. for writing my book, Understanding Genesis. This, okay. this book really is a, it's, it's, it's less about Genesis. It's more about hermeneutics. hermeneutics. And what I did in this book is I said, how, how, how do we approach hermeneutics, the, the study of interpreting the Bible in a presuppositional way? Sure. Now, I've seen people kind of kind of do that a little bit, but I wanted to, to approach it you know, and say, okay, can we know, can, can I make a transcendental argument for the clarity of Scripture that it must mean X uh, because of the impossibility of the contrary? And I think I can make that argument because the mm -hmm. Bible itself does give us rules of interpretation. 
And it, it, that bugs people because it, it brings up this, this idea of circularity that presuppositionalists are always accused of anyway. Uh, but it, there is a degree of circularity there because people say, well, if the Bible gives us the rules for interpretation, then how do we get started? How do I, how do I start reading the scriptures? You know, and it's answered the same way really as anything else. It's a spiral. It's a hermeneutical spiral. God, give us, God has given us enough innate ability in terms of linguistics to be able to read and understand the main and plain teachings of the scriptures. Okay. And that helps correct some of our misconceptions. And when we read it again, we have an improved understanding of it, which corrects more misconceptions and so on. And so the more you read the Bible and think through it logically, uh, I, I believe you can get to the to the meaning of, of the text. And it's not the main and plain doctrines, not that difficult at all. And then the more nuanced doctrines, I think it takes more readings of scripture because we do have that sin nature that we've inherited from Adam. And so, again, mm -hmm. it goes back to Adam. But, uh, yeah. All right. And, okay, so, the, okay, th those are good points. So the issue of hermeneutics, having a proper uh, hermeneutic is vitally important, and it's really the key central issue when we're dealing with Genesis, um, of which the issue of Adam is just one element. I mean, we, we get into this issue of whether someone's interpreting Genesis correctly when you get to other parts, you know, whether you have global flood, local flood, these sorts of things. Um, okay. Um, talking about Dr. Craig then, I, um, based on your understanding of his position then, I mean, I would assume he's coming to Genesis, presumably with the intention of understanding what it means. How does his interpretation differ with yours? Now, obviously he, we know he's not a, a young earth creationist. He doesn't have that, that position. What is Dr. Craig's uh, understanding of Genesis and how does that affect how he interprets uh, the first 11 chapters? Well, he takes it as what he calls mytho history, which okay. is to say that he believes it has elements of it has elements of history in it, but is clothed in the language of myth, and therefore should okay. not be taken as straightforward history. His words that it shouldn't be straight. It's not straightforward history. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it is straightforward history, and I would say there isn't any evidence of of myth in. in and we'll have to define our terms too, because I, I've noticed that Craig actually subtly equivocates on the word myth. Okay. Uh, he may not be aware that he's doing it, but I believe he's doing it, and we okay. can, we can talk about that. But um, it, myth in the sense that it's not it didn't literally happen, or that it's symbolic, or something like that. I would say no, there's no evidence of that in in, in Genesis. And and granted, um, Genesis might contain statements of people that are wrong, or you know I, we understand this. That, but I'm I'm suggesting that what Genesis affirms is factually true. It really did happen in the way that God says it did. And uh, really did happen in six days. There was a literal Adam. He really sinned. Uh, the sin was exactly what the Bible says. God told him not to eat from that tree. He ate from the tree. And we've inherited that sin nature. And so we want to rebel against God by our very nature. We need a change mm -hmm. of heart. We need our sins paid for. And we need our and forgiven. And we need to uh, we need a change of heart to be made um, like Christ in terms of our, our nature. And okay. so uh, but Craig looks at it more figuratively. But it's interesting because he notes there that there are indicators of history there. And so and he can't deny okay. that, which I, I appreciate it. OK, so um, what are some of the points that he brings up to to uh, validate that, you know, that position? So he said that Genesis is uh, should give the, at least the first 11 chapters, I, I believe, that it should be categorized as mytho history. What are some of the data points he uses to support that? Because obviously he's not just making a bare assertion. He's trying to. Uh, def by the way, I mean, in his book, if you just look at the table of contents, I mean, he goes at great lengths trying to support his position, which is what he's supposed to do. Um, mm -hmm. If you if you have a, a position, you want to make sure, um, you know, uh, you're supporting that position. And we know that Craig, uh, Dr. Craig, is he, he makes good and at least trying to attempt to defend position. We might disagree with how he does that. What are some of the ways in which he defends his position that the first 11 chapters is is categorized as mytho history? Okay, there are several. And, and as you know, I've been writing a series of articles uh, critiquing uh, Craig, respectfully. Um, he wrote an article that kind of summarizes his book. Mm -hmm. And I've been going through and just kind of doing a point by point of, of that. And in that article, the first argument that he makes is he claims that the style of Genesis or perhaps the content, he, he kind of combines both. And he says it's very similar to ancient and East, uh, Near Eastern mythology. Okay. OK, so that's his that's his first claim is that there's a similarity between Genesis and these other pagan mythologies, which he, which he would reject, obviously. But sure. um, nonetheless, he says there's a connection there. And that's something that I will dispute. Um, we can come back to the details of that. But and then he also argues that uh, there are certain 
aspects of Genesis that would be extraordinary if taken literally, such as the ages of the patriarchs, the talking uh, serpent, and so on and so forth. Um, I would reject that too, because, well, but, but let's go back to the first, let's go back to the first one. The idea that Genesis has all these similarities to Near Eastern mythologies, it really doesn't. Now, there, there are two mistakes that I see uh, Craig making here. Uh, first of all, he's trying to say that Genesis has kind of a style that's similar to these uh, myths, and it really doesn't. I had the pleasure of taking a, a college class on myth, uh, folklore, and legend when I was at uh, Ohio Wesleyan University. It was a fascinating class. I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I did. I really loved it. And I got to read hundreds and hundreds of different myths in different cultures. And the interesting thing is most of them, almost all of them, have a universe that be either, either is eternal or begins in a chaotic state. And then one or more gods sort of evolve out of that state, really. It's, it's their evolution-based, these, these mythologies. And there's a chaos monster that has to be defeated in order right. for the world to become the good place that it's today. And that theme was almost universal. And it was interesting because our professor, apparently not a Christian, she threw in Genesis into these different, you know, she grouped that, that into, and it was remarkable how different it is from these other mythologies. So if you've really read them, you know, it's not similar at all. Would uh, you, would you say though, um, there are some key differences, but would you say that uh, the, the, the literary structure as to kind of like the days and like the creation of different categories, do you think there's similarities there? Is that maybe what he's getting at that the, the way that the narrative is playing out is very similar to ancient near Eastern myths but the content is unique in that. I think that Dr. Craig would think that Genesis stands unique in very important ways, even though there are some similarities. He may, he may claim that, but I, okay. I would disagree with that because most of these myths are written in a very, uh, um, either a poetic or, or literary, literarily enhanced. Uh, they're not just straightforward narrative. Most of them are not. And so I think the style is very different. But the other thing that was that I thought was interesting, and I thought this was a, a, a mistake in reasoning on Craig's part, is that he uh -huh. argues that the content is so is so similar in mm -hmm. that, and he and he gives specific examples in that it deals with uh, the creation of the universe and of mankind and of a global flood. And let's let's consider those. Let's let, let's put the flood off for a moment. But well, those first two categories, it deals with the creation of the universe and of mankind. Well, yeah, Genesis does, and it's true that. Uh, near Near Eastern origins myths deal with those because if they didn't, they wouldn't be origins myths. So uh, it, it's you know by by construction, any uh, alleged either myth or historical report of the origins of the universe would have to deal with the origins of the universe. Mm -hmm. So to say, well, it's similar on that basis. Well, we're we're excluding all things that are not origin stories. So of course, that's yeah. going to be similar, and that would be and it would, the same would be the case for the Big Bang and Darwinian evolution, which I think Craig would not classify as myth, mm -hmm. but by his by his thinking, they should be. They fall into that same category. They deal with the origins of the universe, the origins of mankind. That's that's what the Big Bang and Darwinian evolution were invoked to explain, albeit in a secular humanistic way. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig re rejects the the atheistic component of that, but he accepts those origin stories. And so they would, they would be very similar too. So I think if he, if he's going to be fair and say, well, we're, you know, let's, let, these things are similar. He would have to include the big bang and evolution as well. Mm. Um, but I would argue that Genesis is very different in that it's giving us um, an historical report of these events. It's not trying to explain them from somebody who came afterwards and is sort of speculating on the past and, and, and telling stories, that would be more along the lines of the Big Bang and, and evolution. But Genesis, I believe it's recorded by eyewitnesses, but at the very least, it's it's written by Moses and inspired by the Holy Spirit who, who saw these events occur. And so it's not mm -hmm. giving us, there's, there's no compelling evidence that it's mythological in any way in terms of its content or um, uh, or the structure. They're, they're very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and again, the content would have to be the same in terms of dealing with the origins because that's what it is. It's an origins account. Right. Now, with regard to the flood, here there are similarities. And in that class on myth, legend, and folklore, I, I was astonished at the number of ancient myths that teach a global flood. Okay. And not just in the Near East, around the world. You can get 
just about every culture there for a while there were two exceptions there was i think egypt and japan and one of them they has since been they found a, they found a flood account there too <laughs> there's but, no flood accounts in japan wait nope there's one <laughs> yeah okay. yeah That's and so point. basically every almost okay. every culture has a flood account if you go okay. back far enough into their history sure and uh, I, I guess you know craig takes that as well see there you go it's similar to myth but i take that as it really happened this this was a real event that happened in history so you're, so you're and, saying that the diverse accounts of, of, of global floods and these other cultures is not similarity of myth telling, but it's a similarity in the sense that there is this common memory of a global event that is reflected in a lot of these myths from these different cultures. Yeah. So passed down. That, okay. Yeah. Passed down by word of mouth, eventually written down okay. uh, Genesis being the accurate account because it's inspired by the Holy spirit. And okay. if, if I'm right, um, I think Moses had access to previous documents that documented these things. There's some evidence of that in Genesis. Mm -hmm. We don't, we can go into that or not. But in okay. any case, um, uh, but I, but I think it's very clear. And Genesis is certainly the original because one of one of the things when I read these other accounts of uh, Epic of Gilgamesh was one of the ones that we read, and uh, mm -hmm. Gilgamesh meets the Noah figure, which is he has a different name. It's uh, like Utna Pishtim, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he meets the Noah figure and and, sure. and describes the uh, the ark. The ark is a cube. In the um, well, that doesn't work physically because a cute, you know, that doesn't make sense. We've had engineers <laughs> study the the actual shape of the ark that the Bible sure. gives, and that that one is designed to weather a worldwide flood. So it's very clear, uh, not just on the basis of the inspiration of Scripture, but for these other reasons that Genesis is the original, and mm -hmm. these other um, legends have, that have spread around the world have distorted some of the details. But nonetheless, most of them have um, God or the gods were angry at mankind. They sent this flood. It, mm -hmm. It's a global flood. Uh, and humans and animals were saved uh, on board an ark. And mm -hmm. those elements are, are common themes. And that's not something that we would be inclined just to kind of make up. Sure. Because if you think about all these other, if you go back and talk about the origin of the universe and of man, uh, almost all these ancient myths are evolution based. There, there's a, they're either an eternal universe or at least one that's very old. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, there's this chaotic state. And then there's this chaos monster that has to be defeated for the world to become the good place it is today. And Genesis is the opposite, and that starts with a, with a uh, in the beginning. There's a beginning of time. God starts it. It's already perfect. When it, as soon as God's finished making it, it's already perfect, right. and chaos is introduced, uh, sure. ultimately because of human beings. And so it really has the opposite kind of structure as these ancient uh, mm -hmm. Near Eastern myths. That's super fascinating. Let, let's 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 kind of focus back on on Adam now. Uh, that's interesting. I think that that that's worth a, a completely other conversation with the issue of the the. The, myth, the, the the flood being global or local that's that's very fascinating um so with respect to adam though when we speak of adam as opposed to like other parts of the bible he's usually connected with the scientific conversation right where you have this kind of um, people having uh, studies in genetics and things like that and how man came about how does the biblical adam cross hairs in some of these scientific discussions with respect to you know what we can know right uh, about the earliest humans. I don't know if my question makes sense. I think it does. And, and let okay. me, uh, this will illustrate too one of the differences between my approach to the Bible and William okay. Lane Craig's approach to the Bible. Okay. I, I start with the Bible as my basic presupposition. I build, I have a philosophy, so does he. We all do, whether we're conscious of it or not. But I try to build my philosophy on the Word of God and let it inform mm -hmm. my understanding of other things. That includes my understanding of science. Uh, some people think that that's uh, a weakness. I think it's a tremendous strength. Most of the founding fathers of science, too, would agree with that. They based their thinking on scripture, and that's how they interpreted the data. Okay. And so uh, when I, in my, sec in, in my, um, um, my, my friends, my Christian friends who have a PhD in relevant fields in genetics, biology, what have you, uh, when they look at the data and I look at it with them, we tend to come to the same conclusions. We, we interpret mm -hmm. the data in a way that's consistent with what the Bible teaches, and we find great harmony there. The, the secular stories don't agree with the Bible, but I would argue the data, the scientific data uh, align, they make sense. The data, the evidence that we see in the present makes sense. Uh, the, the Genetically, we are descended from Adam and Eve, genetically. And, and uh, in fact, my friend Nathaniel Jensen has been working on that very topic. He's a PhD from um, from Harvard, actually. And one of, the, one of the most brilliant creation scientists I know, and he's been studying uh, DNA and, and the lineages you can trace back through either mitochondrial DNA or the Y chromosome. Y chromosome mm -hmm. is passed on uh, in the male line and the uh, mitochondrial DNA is passed on mainly by the, the woman. And so you can trace that back and you can get back to uh, Adam and Eve. And they do go back 
they do go back to two people. Hmm. And even the time scale is interesting too, because uh, some of uh, Dr. Jensen's work uh, researched mutation rates. And we can see the, the rate at which mutations accumulate in the human genome and in other organisms as well. We can see the rate at which the mutations accumulate. And he goes back and says, okay, now how many, how many mutations do we have? What's the mutation rate? How long ago did this organism appear on the earth? And he gets very close to 6,000 years based on oh. all these different studies, which I think is, it's interesting. It's not surprising to me, but uh, sure. it's like, yeah, that's, that's what I'd expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know Rob Carter's done some work on uh, Y chromosome and getting back to the original um, DNA of Adam and Eve, which you can, because we all are descended from Adam and Eve, we all have bits of the information that was in them. We've got some mistakes, mutations that have accumulated, but uh, uh, it's, it's interesting stuff. And, it, and, and it's mm -hmm. something that confirms that we really do come from two human beings. Hmm. Excellent. That's interesting. Um, and maybe uh, at the back end of the episode, you can point people in um, the direction of maybe some good books that deal with uh, the whole issue of Adam and Eve, genetic studies and things like that. I think folks would find that sure. interesting. Now, you wrote a three-part article interacting with uh, Dr. Craig's work. And I want to read um, a quote from Dr. Craig that you provided a response, but maybe you can kind of share it here. I think it'll be um, uh, helpful for folks. Uh, Dr. Craig says the following. He says, what historical claims does the Bible make about Adam and Eve? And is belief in a historical Adam and Eve compatible with the scientific evidence. Why don't you share with us what issue you took with kind of that phraseology uh, of his question? I thought that was interesting when I read the article. I, maybe you can unpack it for us. Well, Craig basically accepts the, the secular origin story. Now he would mm -hmm. say God did it, but he would accept as he would accept Darwinian evolution in some form. He would accept the big bang, the billions of years and so on. So in his view, that's what we know about humanity, mm -hmm. what the secular scientists say. Um, and I take issue with that because I would say right. what we know about humanity is what the Bible teaches. What we know about the origins of the universe is what the Bible teaches. Now, can scientists make guesses about the past? Absolutely. I have no problem with that. Sure. But that's not what we know. What we know is what God has said in his word. What, what we know historically is what is recorded in history books. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is that. It's a history book that tells us the history of the universe, how it began and the history of mankind, how they began. So I want to stop you there. So, so you're saying, okay, from science, someone, someone could say, we know this from science and let's see if it's compatible with what the Bible says. You're saying, well, wait a minute. What we know is what God has said and science is confirmatory. If you have the right presuppositions, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're starting with a very authoritative dogmatic position, which you would, you would openly admit, right. And this is the word yeah. of God. If it's the word of God, it speaks dogmatically. It speaks self-attestingly. So you understand the word of God is saying, this is how God did it. This is what it means. We're able to interpret it. And this is what we know. We don't come to the discussion from, well, science, we know this. Let's see what the Bible says and see if there's a compatibility. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And particularly the opinions of secular scientists. Okay. Um, Craig makes this uh, reification fallacy mistake of, of taking, you know, science teaches this. We know this from science. Okay. Um, science is not an opinion. It's, it's not a person that has opinions on things. It's a, it's a method. Now, scientists have certain beliefs that they teach, and different scientists have, have different conclusions that they draw about the past. And so we need yeah. to be careful about that. It would be more accurate for him to say that he, he accepts what the majority of scientists uh, believe about the past. That would okay. be honest. And I would say, and I, and I disagree with them, because I got to tell you, the majority of scientists do not believe in resurrection from the dead. And mm -hmm. so if we were going to use that as the standard by which we interpreted scripture, we would have to reinterpret the resurrection as being a non-literal, non-historical event. As a myth. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. So, um, and I don't know what Dr. Craig would, would say. I, I wish he would come on. I'd love to have a conversation with him. Maybe we have like a dialogue going on between you and that'd be an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he'd ever do it, but um he, I, this is, this is an issue for me sometimes. So people make a big deal about, how Genesis is compatible with science, right? We can talk about it in a way that Genesis is not irrational. Look, I mean, if you understand it this way, it makes sense. And people team, seem to bend over backwards trying to say, look, Genesis is reasonable if you understand it this way. Uh, yet, you know, when the resurrection is in question, it's like, well, we don't try to reconcile that with science. Yet, in order to make the Bible believable, we try so hard to make it compatible when we're talking about Genesis. I think that's very fascinating. I'm not sure that's what he's doing, but I'm, I see people do it. I mean, you, you know what I mean? 
I think yeah. that's that's fascinating. Uh, real quick, I just want to give a shout, shout out here. Uh, Trinity Radio, uh, who uh, thank you so much for <laughs> your uh, super chat. I think he feels guilty. We had a uh, folks know who uh, Braxton Hunter is over at Trinity Radio. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, we we had some fighting words over the phone. I think he feels guilty. This is guilty money, Braxton. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, but I don't worry, Braxton. I love you, man. It is all good. And thank you so much for your support. If you have not already subscribed to Trinity Radio, you need to get over there and subscribe. That is an excellent, excellent apologetics channel. Not presuppositional, but hey, God can strike a blow with a broken stick, right? <laughs> a crooked stick. I love you, Braxton. Thank you so much for uh, for that super chat. Um, and also, uh, Israel, thank you so much for your $5 super chat. Um, we'll, we'll take some of those questions a little bit later. Um, so if you do have questions, you could ask away, but um, thank you for the support. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Okay. So um, let's uh, continue on here. So um, you said something to the effect of uh, belief in a historical Adam and Eve. I is it compatible with the scientific evidence? And you said that that was an odd question. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Because it, it's um, normally when we talk about historical claims, we don't say, now, is that compatible with science, however? You know, did, did okay. uh, George Washington really cross the Delaware on this particular date and so on? What does the science say? Um, that's a past event. Science is about understanding how the universe operates today, the predictable, orderly way God upholds his creation. Historical events are not normally um, conclusively uh, discernible by the scientific method because there's, mm. there's, no there's no repeatability. There's no testability on the past. That's not to say we can't, apply the methods of science to make some guesses about the past, but then to take that as the standard by which you then compare a historical document, that's that's backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, when we want to know about a historical claim, we consult history books. And I realize that history books, I mean, they can make mistakes too, but we compare them with others and so on. That's how we learn about history primarily. And then uh, we don't say, you know, no, is that compatible with science? Well, um, science isn't equipped to, to answer historical questions, not directly. And it's especially odd when we talk about the Holy Scriptures, because the Scriptures, I would argue that Genesis, including a literal Genesis, is necessary in order to justify our confidence in the scientific method. Because we scientists use a principle called uniformity in nature or induction, mm -hmm. by which we draw general conclusions about specific, in, specific uh, instances and that makes sense if God upholds the universe in a consistent way, which he's promised to do in Genesis 8.22, if that's literal history and not the myth part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would argue that the scientific method is predicated upon the history of Genesis being literally true. And so it's a, it's a very strange mm -hmm. question to ask about past events and whether or not that, that's possible scientifically, particularly um, by a book inspired by God who can do what he wants. Well, couldn't Dr. Craig, because uh, because really the issue is, I mean, really boil down to it. It's an issue of interpretation. Um, now, granted, he might have a different view of than you have with respect to like biblical inerrancy. I'm not sure what, this, what his position is. I've listened to him make some comments. I'm not sure where his position is. But I suppose, couldn't he hold to um, his interpretation of Genesis, but a biblical worldview as a whole provides a foundation for uniformity. So couldn't he have a justification for assuming uniformity given a biblical worldview as he understands it while understanding Genesis literarily in the way that he does? Does that, does, does my question make sense? Yeah. And, and I don't think he can because the, okay. the, the verses that I would look at where God promises stability in nature, he, he either okay. it's, they're either in Genesis or they link back to Genesis. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, the God's covenant with day and night. Well, where does he make that covenant? Genesis. And so, okay. so I don't, I don't think apart from Genesis, you can, you can really argue that at least that's the foundation for it is in that first book of the Bible. That's where we mm. see God imposing, creating a universe, an orderly universe, and then imposing a consistent order on it over time. And since God doesn't change and knows the future, we can, we can count on that, that uniformity in nature. Mm. All right. Thank you for that. Um, why don't you also, you said something that maybe some folks who are not familiar with presuppositionalism and the way, I mean, we can step two seconds aside from, from Adam for a second. You said something about the, um, having a literal interpretation of Genesis actually provides, uh, uh, the foundation for induction and things like that. Can you unpack that a little bit? Cause some people might think, well, what does he mean by that? That I don't sure. see how that's yeah. connected. Yeah. D uh, David Hume, for example, the secular philosopher was, um, stumped on the question of how do we know the sun will rise tomorrow? Right. And it, it will do no good to say, well, it rose yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. 
Okay. Uh, unless you already knew that there was some kind of underlying orderliness by which fu the future is somehow like the past. And, and, and we use that principle in science. We use it every day. We use it when you get up in the morning. You assume that gravity will work today like it worked yesterday. We couldn't survive without that principle. And David right. Hume wanted to know the epistemological justification for that. Why is it that we know the sun will rise tomorrow? He, he knew that, but he didn't know how he knew it. And uh, Genesis 8.22 gives us the reason. God promised in Genesis 8.22 that the basic cycles of nature, nature and he gives uh, specifically specific examples, the day and night cycle, uh, the seasons, as specific examples. It says, as long as the earth remains, those will continue. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that every summer will be as hot or as cold as the previous one, but it does mean there will always be a summer and right. there will always be a winter. And there we will always expect be a day. regularity. So we, again, can expect, we can expect regularity. Yes, we can expect right. regularity in nature because we have a promise from God. And that promise is given after the flood uh, where there was a temporary disruption in what's at least, at least it seemed like a disruption in the normal cycles right. of nature. There was no harvest in the flood year. Right. And so uh, it might have seemed like, you know, that's that's a disruption. And God's saying that's not going to happen again. There are these basic cycles that will continue as long as the earth remains. Right. And the expectation for regularity is not incompatible, given the Christian worldview, with the expectation that God can also perform the miraculous. Of Some course. people think there's an inconsistency right. there. But right. all right. So uh, Dr. Craig also says this, and you mentioned this in your article. He says, only after having determined what the Bible actually says about the historical Adam, shall we be in a position to judge whether those claims are compatible with what we know of human origins from contemporary science. Why don't you speak to that? I know you mentioned it in your article. Why don't you unpack that a little bit for us? My, my, only, obje my only objection to that statement is his word, no. And, it, and it sh he's shown his cards. He's shown okay. that he, his faith is in what the secularists say about origins. And let's okay. just be honest about it. He's, Craig's a nice guy. I, 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 that's that's mm -hmm. not the issue. But he, he believes that the secularists are right when they teach the Big Bang and evolution. And I, I mean, I find that comical as a scientist, as a PhD scientist. I have I know quite a bit about the Big Bang. We covered that in, in my graduate mm -hmm. school classes. So I know mm -hmm. the problems with it. And I'm thinking, wow, um, that's what you have your confidence in. Not a good idea. Um, part of the issue is um, people try to equivocate the Big Bang. They try to make it equal to the kind of operational science that puts people on the moon. They're not the same thing. The kind of science that puts people on the moon is testable, repeatable in the present. Uh, the Big Bang, speculation about the past, and it's got lots of problems. Why don't you unpack that? I think that's an important distinction uh, that you made. So there's a difference between operational science and historical science. Why don't you unpack what that difference is and why it's so important to recognize those two elements there? Okay. Operational science is what we think of as real science. It's the kind of science that makes computers work, puts people on the moon. Okay. It is It is based on the scientific method. Okay. which uh, requires, you know, you have a hypothesis and then you you perform an experiment or at the very least an observation that, that potentially could falsify your hypothesis. It requires experimentation or at the very least observation in the present. Hmm. And if you don't have that, then you're not doing operational science. Whereas yes. historical science says, well, we've got these tools that we developed for, you know, the science testing the world in the present. Can, can we use those to make an educated guess about the past? The answer is yes, we can. But that's all that will remain. It will remain an educated guess about the past. It's not something the past is not directly testable by the scientific method because we can't repeat it and okay. we can't observe it. OK, so that's the distinction there. And so my, go ahead. Well, well, OK, so I know that um, Dr. Hugh Ross, who you've had uh, a conversation with on this show, which, by the way, I, I still get comments uh, in my email about, oh, it was a great uh, conversation. That's that was an excellent and very helpful. Good. If folks haven't watched it, go back. Um, Dr. Lyle and Hugh Ross um, have an, in, a very engaging, energetic, but very informative uh, conversation. So folks want to check that out. But um, Hugh Ross would say something to the effect that when you look out into the, the sky, you're looking at the past. And um, so so it's not so it's not kind of like looking at, you know, when we're talking about historical events uh, on Earth, we can't observe that. But some might argue that we could observe the past when we're looking you know, at the cosmos through the telescopes and the technology mm -hmm. that they have to kind of uh, map out what they think the universe looked like um, earlier on. How would you speak to that? Is that accurate or do you take issue with that as well? I take some issue with that because he's Ross is assuming what we call the Einstein synchrony convention, which is one method by which we define what now means okay. at a distance. And I'm not suggesting that's necessarily wrong, but it is certainly not the only way to do it. There are other synchrony conventions 
there's the visual synchrony convention, which was used by everyone until the 1600s, whereby uh, what, what you see happening in space happens in real time. Mm. So we're not looking into the past if you use that convention. But either way, even if we use the Einstein synchrony convention and we say, well, that actually happened in the past, you still, you still only have one point in time. You can still only analyze one point in time. The fact that we're calling it in the past uh, is irrelevant to the fact that we, we, don't, we don't have a sequence. We don't have a sequence of events that we can see for a given location in the universe over time. We can't, we can't mm. rewind the tape and go back and see what it was like in the distant past or sure. in the future. Oh, so I think so even happens. astronomy still has that limitation of being, um, we, we can only do astronomy in the present. That's, you know, sure. look at the stars in the present. If you want to call the light that came from it the past, you can do that. It's not required. Physics works just as well if you mm -hmm. allow it to be instantaneous. Um, I've written on that topic. But in any case, uh, it's, it, okay. astronomy still has the same limitation. All right. Excellent. Now, I want to go back to the statement I read because mm -hmm. you said uh, that you think that Dr. Craig shows his card. So mm -hmm. why don't you tell us what that means? and then unpack it as to how it's relevant to the statement here. So let me read the, the Dr. Craig's quote here. It says, only after, only after having determined what the Bible actually says about the historical Adam, shall we be in a position to judge whether those claims are compatible with what we know of human origins from contemporary science. And you said that Dr. Craig shows his hand. It looks like you've identified a presupposition somewhere in there that you take issue with. Why don't you unpack that for us? The, the presupposition is that first, again, he's reifying science. Science doesn't say anything. Okay. We don't, we, you know, science is a method. Contemporary science is a method. And what are some of the results of that? Well, it depends on who you ask. Different scientists will come up with different understandings of past events because we have different worldviews. My, my issue with Craig is that he has accepted the secular story of origins. He has. He thinks that's science. He thinks it's been established by science. He thinks that's, he thinks that's what we know from contemporary okay. science. And I would say what you're really trusting in is a secular story about the past, one that's mm -hmm. not really compatible with the Bible. That being said, I do want to give him credit because if he were, if he were to change that and say compatible with what most secular scientists believe, then I would agree with his with with his statement. We should we should kind of try to be as objective as possible and not be influenced by our culture. We can't get we can't mm -hmm. completely get away from that. But so we do you think, try to, so you do think Dr. Craig doesn't think there's a distinction between because you're using secular, so you already are setting up kind of a category. There's secular science, mm -hmm. and then there's the kind of science that's not secular science. Do you think? And I wish I could I could ask him myself, but do you think that that he's assuming? that science is just this neutral discipline, it doesn't matter, secular or whatever. There's just this science that we do. Yes, we have presuppositions and there are different things that we enter, but he's kind of seeing it as kind of this discipline that's done really in uh, in an objective fashion. And so this is what the data tells us and this is what we know. Is, is, is Do you think that's where he's coming from? Yeah, there, there are secular scientists and there are creation scientists and we draw different conclusions about the data because of our different worldviews. Okay. Science is not a monolithic body of knowledge. It isn't. It's a method that we use to discover how God upholds his universe today. There's mm. some of the predictable ways that, that God upholds his universe today. And I think the reason that uh, Craig, and frankly, most Christians haven't thought this through either, to be perfectly okay. honest with you. But So I'm not, I'm not trying to knock him, but if he's going to write on this, he needs to step up his game a little bit and, and become okay. knowledgeable of these things. Because the fact is, when it comes to operational science, creation scientists and secular revolutionary scientists largely agree on how things work because they're directly testable in the present. Because we at least mm -hmm. agree on the scientific method, which is based on creation. But the evolutionists can pretend that it isn't. And uh, and they at least they, they have respect for the method. Evolution is triggered. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I'm happy to. I'm happy to chat about that, but hey. He's like, you need Christianity to do that anyway. Right? <laughs> That's right. Well, hey, I'm a presuppositionalist. I know these things. That's in right. any case, um, there is a difference between uh, the, the kind of science that we all agree in and these stories about the past. And I think most people have the impression that they're the same thing, that the Big okay. Bang deserves the same kind of respect as, say, quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Uh, quantum mechanics is something that's testable in the present by experimentation and observation of the results of those experiments. The Big Bang is not testable in the present. It's a speculation about the past and it has issues with it. It has problems, hmm. um, problems that we really, I mean, it's not that we don't have any issues in operational science either, but they tend to work themselves out over time as we do different experiments and, and see the hmm. results of them. 
And so the Big Bang, it, it's not that way. So now that's interesting. See, I, I was I was raised on the uh, when I did apologetics, um, and uh, gratefully, and I'm glad I was exposed to Dr. Craig's work in a lot of areas. The areas that I tend to agree with him on, right? Uh, but even areas that I've changed my position uh, with respect to the the Big Bang, it is spoken of by apologists, right, as well as secular scientists, right, that this is just a given. I mean, this is just nobody dis no, nobody disputes this. Of course, um, secluding all of the young Earth creationists who don't hold to that, they're not real scientists, right? That's the the mentality, right? Or or we tip their hat, they're scientists, but they're misguided. You know, they don't, they're not. Uh, um, uh, I I do you have a, a video on on you know, your channel or your website or something where you talk about some of the difficulties as you see it with the the theory of the Big Bang? I know it's not our topic today, but is there a resource you can point people to? That'd yes, definitely, one. definitely. Yeah, I, um, on, our, on our website, I have a, um, a, a series of articles on the Big Bang and some of the problems with okay. it. And they're, they're kind of, it's kind of a short summary of some of the problems. But the nice thing is I stuck with problems that are acknowledged in the secular textbooks so that people can see, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. These are real issues that secularists are aware of. They may think that they've solved it in some cases, mm -hmm. but they are issues that you'll find even in the secular textbooks among honest uh, secular astronomers. So yes, mm -hmm. go to our article and, and, and do a search for uh, Big Bang, you'll get that. There was a talk I did a long time ago called Big Problems with the Big Bang. Okay. And uh, I think that's, I, I did that back when I was working with Answers in Genesis. They may or may not have it anymore. I haven't okay. seen it in a while, and I haven't yeah, done it in a while, so I need, to okay. I need to revive that one. Yeah, hey, well, maybe we'll have you on in the future to talk about the Big Bang. Sure. That'd be cool. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, Dr. Craig goes on to say, um, with respect to um, uh, the similarities of Genesis to um, ancient Near East, uh, the ancient Near Eastern literature, um, I'm going to read the quote here. Maybe you could speak to it, because this really is wrapped up in his idea that uh, Genesis, again, includes more than Adam, but includes Adam. Uh, Genesis is this kind of like mytho history, uh, mytho historical genre. So, so Dr. Craig goes on to say, he says, Old Testament scholars have long remarked on the resemblance of Genesis 1 through 11 to the religious literature of the ancient Near East. How would you speak to that? Because this is often comes up. There's similarities here. I know you brought you kind of touched on it before, but maybe you could unpack that a little bit more for us. It's it's not true it, uh, that uh, this is something that's very recent. Actually, it's been only the last couple centuries that we've even really had abundant knowledge of the the ancient Near Eastern uh, mythologies. So okay. it's not something that has been long remarked by theologians. There are a few theologians that in modern times have said that. But as I pointed out earlier, I think the uh, similarities are exaggerated because the the only two similarities that I really see are that they deal with origins, the origins of the universe mm -hmm. and the origins of mankind. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be origins myths. So I, I, <laughs> so it's, it's like being surprised that Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday this year be, because of the way we're, we've classified them. They have to deal with those or they wouldn't be in the category. Okay. That being said, the details are very different. Again, with these with these uh, um, other myths, the ancient Near Eastern myths, you start with usually an internal universe or a very old one. Um, it's sort of an evolutionary view. The gods have evolved. And then there's a chaos monster that must be defeated in order for the creation to become the very good place that it is today. And Genesis is the opposite. You start with one all-powerful God who speaks the universe into existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's, it's created very good. At every step, it's good. And at the end, it's very good. And then chaos is introduced by our actions, death and suffering. So um, mm -hmm. it's interesting because these, these secular myths, um, which the Big Bang qualifies, Darwinian evolution qualifies, and then these ancient Near Eastern myths, they have things in common in that they start with an eternal or very old universe, that evolutionary, all the things come together. And sure. then and then mankind is sort of the pinnacle of create. We're sort of the best thing that, that came about other than maybe the gods and some of these other views. Mm -hmm. And man has always been mortal and so on. Whereas in the creation, in, in the biblical creation view, it's just the opposite. We start with a very good universe. We're the bad guys in the creation story because we're the right. ones that brought sin and death into the world. Hmm. Now, uh, it seems that Dr. Craig uh, acknowledges the uh, apparent resemblance of the... Well, let me just read the quote here before I, I don't want to screw it up here. So <laughs> Dr. Craig says the following. Grand themes such as the creation of the world, the origin of mankind, and the near destruction of humanity in a cataclysmic flood are present in both the ancient myths and Genesis 1 through 11. So it seems that he acknowledges that there is this wide testimony to these cataclysmic events what what is he trying to point out there and how does he understand that as kind of supporting what he's what he's getting at as opposed to say something that you would argue 
So I think he's combining two different things that need to be handled separately. Okay. The, the, or, the, the origin of the universe, the origin of mankind. Yes, origins myths deal with those because if they didn't, they wouldn't be origins myths. So is that a similarity to Genesis? It's a, it's a necessary similarity. And the Big Bang and evolution, same thing. Mm -hmm. Floods in a different category because the flood, I would argue, is a real event. And I would argue that, yeah, there are myths. There are I would say they're more along the line of legends that deal with a worldwide flood. But again, you, you will see that in some of the ancient Near Eastern uh, literature. You'll see that Epic, Epic of Gilgamesh, again, refers to uh, uh, Utna, Utna Pishnim, who was the Noah, yeah, the Noah those character. Names are, those names are rough. Yeah. To... The, names, the names are different. In different cultures, they'll have different names. But that might be explained by the confusion of tongues at Babel. So, mm -hmm. so even so, the literal history of Genesis can explain that too. Why they why, why they would have different names for these characters, but uh, almost all cultures do have that that memory, that ancient memory of a worldwide flood because it happened. And so, I think it, it proves the opposite of what Craig wants it to prove. I think he wants it. He wants to say, well, Genesis is kind of similar to these myths. No, it's not. And the re and the only reason that the flood account is similar is because it happened. And Genesis would be the historic record of that flood. And then mm. these other legends around the world would be uh, the distorted memories of that of that event. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, Craig goes on to say, um, well, he asked the question, uh, should the primeval narratives of Genesis 1 through 11 be understood then as a compilation of Israelite myths? So you would give the answer to that question a start. No. no. Right. So, <laughs> OK. Um, and then he says, in raising this question, we're using the definition of myth employed by folklorists and classicalists. A myth is a traditional sacred narrative explaining how the world and man came to be in their present form. A myth seeks to explain present realities by anchoring them in the prehistoric past and so to validate a culture's contemporary institutions and values. Um, would you agree with that statement, his understanding of myth? And how is he using that to make the point that he's trying to, to get at. Okay, a lot to unravel here. Uh, two points. Would I agree with that statement as written? No, one word prevents me from agreeing with that, prehistoric, because okay. I would argue that Genesis is history. In my view, there is no such thing as prehistoric because it's okay. in the beginning. The beginning of time is recorded. It's recorded history. And so there is no prehistoric in, 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 in my worldview. Okay, so I would disagree with that. But if we subtract that word, does Genesis fit the other qualifications for his definition of myth as he's using it here? Sure. In that it grounds the, the realities of Israel, and not just Israel, but Christians, uh, modern Christians as well. The reason we have the reason we have marriage is because Adam and Eve and so on. The reason mm -hmm. we don't steal is because uh, God ultimately owns everything and he's made the rules and so on. The reason we don't murder is man's made the image of God. So yes, it, 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 these present realities are anchored back in Genesis. And if, if he says, I'm going to use that definition of a myth, that's okay, because that definition of a myth does not exclude Genesis also being literal history. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so by that definition, Genesis can be straightforward history, and yet because it grounds present realities uh, in that history, you can classify it as myth. And by the way, if he's going to use that definition, he has to put the Big Bang in there and Darwinian evolution as well, because they are used by secularists to explain the reality of our universe today. The Big Bang is supposed to explain... Uh, why you know hydrogen is the most abundant element, and so on. That's a present reality that it seeks to explain. So, but they wouldn't. Modern folks today wouldn't call that a myth in this sense because they've already assumed. Well, that's science, as though that's given us kind of the final word on, or at least the more probable word uh, on the issue. So they wouldn't categorize. You, you think that's an arbitrary kind of like, yeah, that's myth. But this, this is really science. We all know that universe began to exist. Okay. In this way. It, well, the issue is the word myth and the fact that it has multiple definitions. I'm just suggesting that right. if we used Craig's definition, um, but I subtract the word prehistoric from it, mm -hmm. then Genesis would qualify, but that doesn't mean it's also not literal. It's, it's a liter it is literal history. It really happened. The events are, are, are accurate. And I would, and I would argue if he's going to use that definition and we'll put back in the word prehistoric, he has to, he has to put evolution and the Big Bang in that category, because it fits verbatim. It fits okay. verbatim what he's saying. So if he's going to call Genesis a myth, by that definition, he has to call the Big Bang and Darwinian evolution myth as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now see, the, the, the issue then is I believe he switches to a different definition of myth later on, because later okay. on he'll make the argument that since Genesis has all these mythic qualities, it's not straightforward history. Now, wait a minute. That's a different definition of the word myth. There, One of the definitions of myth is something that's not provable or not anchored in reality. Okay. Something that's 
fictional or something of that nature. Okay. And therefore shouldn't be interpreted straightforward history, but that's not the definition that he just gave. Hmm. And so I think it's a bait and switch fallacy. I think he's baiting us in and I, I'm not suggesting that he's doing it with any ill intentions. He may have, sure. he may not be aware of it himself, but I think he's baiting us in on this definition of myth. That's actually almost again, with one word removed, it, it would Genesis would kind of qualify. And then he switches to a different definition of myth to say, therefore, it's not straightforward history. And so that's the that's the equivocation fallacy or fallacy of four terms. OK, uh, Dr. Craig also says this. I think this is interesting, too. So uh, he says the lines between myth, folktale and legend are apt to be blurry, but we can identify certain family resemblance that unite most myths. I, I don't know if this is what he's getting at, but maybe it, maybe it's not. I mean, my, maybe my question is completely unrelated to that, but. How does he, I mean, because I don't, a lot of people were accusing Dr. Craig of denying a historical Adam. Now that's right, not, which he that's, technically that's, isn't. Yeah. yeah, that's not quite right. Right. And that, yeah. that's important. And, and I think um, just for folks who are very easily kind of, they kind of get excited like, oh man, look, Dr. Craig is at it again. He's saying something crazy, you know, like if that's their perspective, right? I have to be very careful not to accuse him of something he's not doing. And this is, um, this shows, um, um, how can I say this? It shows a disrespect for the conversation when folks kind of just uh, join the bandwagon of like accusations without knowing kind of the foundation. If you disagree with him, fine, you know, you give your reasons, but we don't want to say stuff like, well, he denies a historical Adam. You need to understand his position. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't deny a historical Adam. But I guess my question to you um, is if Genesis is mytho history, but it's getting at certain truths, how does he distinguish between the myth aspect and the reality aspect of like, okay, there's myth, but there's a core of reality. How does he make that distinction? I mean, what is the, the standard of making that distinction such that we can say, well, this, this element here is historical and this is why this is important. It's foundational. It, it gives a foundation for all this other stuff in scripture. How does he process that based on your own understanding of how he might do that? Not consistently, not okay. consistently. Um, the bottom line is, and this is based on what I said earlier about you mm -hmm. know him coming into this with with the worldview. We all we all have that, sure. but he has accepted uncritically the secular teachings about origins. And I would I would say I would suggest to you, bec but because he also has a commitment to the Bible, he wants to say I believe the Bible. It's true. I would argue that ultimately his presupposition is those aspects of Genesis that are not compatible with the secular. Uh, narrative on origins; those are the parts he would attribute to myth, mm -hmm. and because uh, he because he if he if he attributes them to history, then he has to say that the Bible is not compatible with what he believes is contemporary science, and he doesn't mm -hmm. want to go that route. It would be a nightmare, right. he says, if that if that were true. Mm -hmm. Now he would try to argue. I, I think he tries to to sh say, well, no, I've got textual reasons for that, and what he does is he goes to other passages in Scripture that reference back to. Adam and Eve, he refers to, you know, Paul in, in, in uh, Romans 5, talking about how death entered the world as a result of Adam's sin. And Craig rightly recognizes that Paul must be talking about a historical figure mm -hmm. because a fictional uh, person can't have consequences in the real world. And I think Craig's reasoning is spot on. I just wish he would apply that consistently because then when he comes to Jesus, Jesus also quotes Genesis 1 and 2. Jesus quotes them as the basis for uh, marriage. And in, in that area, Craig says, oh, no, that's, he says, no, that's figurative. That's just a literary Adam. Jesus is making sort of a comparison there. And I, and I get what he's trying to do, but that's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus was showing that that marriage had its foundational origins in the creation accounts. And Jesus quotes Genesis 1 and 2 as literal history. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think if we were to, if we really were to use the Bible consistently as we, as we should do, there, there is, every biblical author treats Adam and Eve and the events of Genesis as real history. I mean, Jesus said that his coming would be like the days of Noah and Lot. Now there, it's interesting because he's mentioning two people, one of which Craig would put in that in that mytho history, and the other one, because after Abraham, uh, Craig says, no, it's literal history after, after Abraham. So you got Lot there. Now Jesus... Jesus okay, well, it's time out. Time yeah, out. Yeah. Time yeah. out. Time out. Okay. This is another question I have. Okay. Yeah. So Genesis 1 through 11 gets a lot of the flack. This is that's the center of kind of these debates. I hate to sound tr like the traditional presuppositionalist, but by what standard, <laughs> okay, does someone stop at 11 
and say, all right, now we're in history. Like, I don't get that. It seems like there's a presupposition of kind of like there's this just this disjointing of the first part there for the first 11 chapters. And then there's something completely different going on. Um, how do how do folks work that out? I, 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 I've studied the issue, but I still I don't understand uh, how they do that. Maybe you can unpack that for us. Sorry for interrupting your flow. No, it's fine. It's relevant. Um, okay. Well, what is Craig's ultimate standard? And I would argue that Craig's ultimate standard is his philosophy and his assumption that the secular narratives regarding origins are correct. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he would he would even secularists will acknowledge that Abraham was a real person who lived. And so, see, he can adopt that and say, that's OK, that's con that's that's compatible with contemporary si science. But all these other things that happen in Genesis are not. And so because that's his standard, that's where that's where he draws the line. That's where he says, OK, now I can mm -hmm. start believing some of this stuff. It's compatible with my philosophy. It's compatible with my uh, the, the things that I accept are science. Um, I'm looking at it from the text and I'm saying the style of Genesis 1 through 11 is identical to the style of Genesis 12 through the rest of the, the book. They're the same style. The, the content is seamless. It, I mean, it goes for it, you have the, the, the patriarchs and, and even even Craig acknowledges that's that's powerful. The fact you have these chronologies that go mm -hmm. from Adam continuously through Abraham. There's no sudden break at at, at chapter 12. Now, the, the we, we focus in more on Abraham in chapter 12, but the the. Um, there's no change in style. And so I would argue that if Genesis 12 and beyond is history, then so is Genesis 1 through 11. They're written in the same way. They're written in historical narrative, in Hebrew, frequent use of the Bob consecutive, and this happened and that happened and so on. That's mm -hmm. always indicative of a historical narrative everywhere it occurs in the Old Testament of the Bible. So mm -hmm. uh, poetic sections don't use, they might have an individual Bob consecutive, but not a chain sure. of them. So there's sure. no doubt from, from, if we're gonna be exegetical, if we're gonna look at the text itself and let it determine what genre it is, it's history. Mm. That's interesting there. So, okay. So, um, Dr. Craig goes on to say with respect to myths, understanding the roles and the, and the role and the function of myth, he says that myths are sacred for the society that embraces them. And that's true, but you had kind of a, a zinger response in your article. Maybe you could unpack that. Uh, you, you said something to the effect of uh, all of the Bible is sacred for Christians. What, what, what are you getting at there in terms of kind of like a response to his acknowledgement that myths play this important role you're kind of pointing out, yes, and well, why don't you consider this thing over here? Why don't you unpack what you said there in that article? I'm trying to press Craig to be logically consistent with his position. Okay. And if he's going to argue that something is classified as myth on the basis that it's it's cherished, it's it, you know, it's it's held in high esteem, it's it's um it's sacred, all the Bible's that way. And yet I I would hope that Craig would not argue that the resurrection of Jesus is a myth. Now I hold that to be the most sacred. I mean, all scripture is sacred, but that's that's important, isn't it? I mean, that's that's the foundation of our faith is the death, the atoning death and the resurrection of Christ. Um, and I, I I hold that as sacred and it, it informs my worldview and it, 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 it informs the way I live. Mm -hmm. And so would we classify it as myth on that basis? And and again, furthermore, um, the Big Bang and evolution are held with religious fervor by those people who believe them. They mm -hmm. really are. And that informs their worldview and the way they think about things. And so I'm asking Craig to be consistent. If he's going to classify Genesis as myth on that basis, he should classify the whole Bible as myth on that basis. And frankly, Darwinian evolution and Big Bang as well. Mm. And then I think, but if he did that, then I think he would he would recognize that he's he's uh, making an error in reasoning. He's making an equivocation fallacy when he argues. Therefore, since it has since it's myth, it shouldn't be classified as straightforward history. Uh, not by that definition of myth, no. Sure. Because because of the resurrection of Christ, that is that's straightforward history. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I want to leave some time as we're on the top of the hour here. I usually go longer, but I, I you know what it is. I usually have long conversations with my guests, and then I feel bad that I have them too long when we also go through the questions. So I want to an hour is good. And then maybe we can go through some questions. We'll get a bunch of them in and, and then I'll, I'll let you go, man. I appreciate it so much. I know you're busy. So this has been excellent. I'm sure folk, folks, I've been looking in the comments. Folks are really enjoying this conversation. So my, my last question uh, for you, uh, Dr. Lyle, um, if Dr. Craig was here right now, he was sharing the screen, what would you say to him in terms of this issue of the historical Adam? If you were to say, hey, as a Christian brother, here are some points of advice that I'd like to share. I know we have some disagreements here. How would you share your heart with Dr. Craig on this issue if he was, uh, uh, if we sliced the screen up and he was sharing the screen with us? 
You know, I, one of the things, going back to that earlier statement that he made about, you know, it's best to just look at the text and then later see if it's compatible with what he thinks is modern science. Okay. I would say that's actually a commendable sentiment. Um, but I would, I, would, I would say respectfully, you just haven't done that. Uh, you, you have a very strong conviction for whatever reason that the Big Bang is true, that Darwinian evolution is true, that millions of years deep time is true. And I realize we get hammered with that over and over and over again. But you've taken that as a presupposition that you've imported into the text. And I, and I, I would suggest that if you didn't do that, uh, you would not come to the conclusions that you come to, because mm -hmm. there's no indication that any um, biblical author believed in the millions of years or believed in anything comparable to evolution or a big bang. They all took Genesis as, as literal history. And Christ certainly did. He quoted, he quoted from Genesis in Matthew 19 quotes from Genesis one and two as history. And therefore we, as Christ followers, we should do, we should do the same. That mm. would be one, that would be one thing I would say to him. And then I would ask him also to consider uh, what having death before Adam sinned in the world uh, does mm. to the gospel message, because that's significant. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Well, let's jump right into the questions. I'm going to get this one out of the way because I know a lot of people have been asking it. I'm, I'm not even going to put it on the screen because I don't want it to become an issue. But um, what is your rule for folks that you do engage in debates? Why don't you lay that out? And so maybe that can answer people's questions because there are you know, debate challenges coming left and right. Why don't you just share your position then we'll move on from there? Because I know these sorts of things can get very confrontational, like, oh, debate. Sure. No, you know. What's your view on that? And we can move on for uh, you move on from there. I, I want to make sure the person is is qualified so that the debate is good. And therefore, I, I require a, a Ph.D. or perhaps a, a, a Th.D. Somebody who has a doctorate in the field who is who has studied the issue, who has studied. There's some evidence where they're at least familiar with with what it is that I teach. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just it's not going to be a good debate. And I, I don't want to get, you know, because they're, you know, they're 16 year olds. I want to debate you, Dr. Lau. That's not going to be a good debate. It's, it's just not going to, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to insult smart 16 anything, year olds but, out there. Come on. Yeah, but, you know, um, it's just not going to go well. And I, and I, and I also, there are a lot of people that, although they're well meaning, I think they're doing a lot of damage to scripture. And I don't, frankly, don't want to give them a platform. Now, somebody like William Lane Craig already has a platform. And if you would want to debate me on this issue, I would be happy to do that. So mm -hmm. if you're out there, Craig, I would I would be happy to debate you on this issue. It can be, uh, you're a nice guy. I, it would be a cordial debate, but I, I don't think your position stands up to rational scrutiny. Hmm. Well, I'd love to host that. That'd be amazing. That'd be a really great conversation. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, this is a question from Nate uh, Werner. He says, does Dr. Lyle give research presentations at universities? Is that something you do? Um, I have. Of course, I'm, I'm speaking a lot now, and I don't do a, a whole lot of original research. I do a little bit, but I don't have the time. Re scientific research is a full-time thing, and I, I did that for years before I went into, into ministry. And, yeah, I've presented at universities in terms of presenting. Maybe they're thinking original research that I've done. Well, I mean, I have done original research on the Starlight issue, and I presented that at, at universities. But it's usually in the context of a Christian group that has asked me to speak on campus. It's open to everyone, so it'll be a combination of Christians and non-Christians that attend those presentations. Mm -hmm. I don't get that opportunity very often, but I, when I do, I take it. Hmm. Now, this is not a question, but I think it's uh, interesting. To, it's, I think it's an important point to, to go through. Marlon Wilson, um, who I, I know you've been on his show before, mm -hmm. he says, one of the main disagreements I have with William Lane Craig is his seeming denial of original sin. Uh, and I think he, he says, I think he does this in order to substantiate his position on Adam. I'm not sure if that's the, the motivation, but um, what are your thoughts on uh, Craig's statements? I'm trying to look for it here. Um, I won't waste too much time. Okay, here, I, I do have it here. So on in his book, uh, In the Quest for the Historical Adam, he says a couple of things. He says, thus, while the doctrine of original sin depends crucially on the fact of a historical Adam, Christianity need not embrace the traditional doctrine of original sin, but may content itself with affirming the universal wrongdoing of human beings and their inability to save themselves. Now, before you address that, I want to read another portion uh, here, if you don't mind, and then maybe you could address it. So um, he says, Paul does not teach clearly that, one, Adam's sin is imputed to every one of his descendants, and two, Adam's sin resulted in a corruption of human nature or a privation of original righteousness that is transmitted to all of his descendants. That Christianity can get along without one is evident from the example of the Orthodox Church, whose doctrine of original sin affirms only, point two, and then he goes on to explain, um, he seems to have a, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, he seems to have a weak view 
of original sin. And that's just to say that he might hold to it, but he doesn't think it's a, it's that much of a, of a big deal. Christianity can get along um, without that doctrine as traditionally understood from a Protestant perspective. How would you speak to that? I disagree with him on that issue. I think original sin is important. Uh, and I don't understand how he would reconcile that. We'd have to define our terms too, but I, mm -hmm. I believe that because of Adam's sin, we're born into the world as rebels against God. Yeah. That's what, and, and so we've inherited that, that sin nature. We sin willingly from conception. Uh, we're, we're conceived in iniquity, the Bible says. So I don't know how he would get around that as, as well as passages, you know, that say things like, um, uh, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Mm. That tells me that we need help uh, to just just to confess Christ as Savior in, in a saving way is the is the implication in that in that verse. Mm. So that tells me that uh, we're born with hearts that are corrupted. That and there's it, there's so many passages. There's none who seek after God and so on. I take that to mean there's none who seek after God. I think that's what it means. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, those people who are saved are because God has, has entered into their lives and turns their heart around and regenerated and granted them repentance. That, that, that's such a weird thing to say, but the Bible does in more than one place talk about uh, God, may God grant them repentance. We tend mm -hmm. to think as repentance is, well, that's something that I mustered up myself. And it's huh. something that God grants us. Second and Timothy 224. Pardon yeah. me? Second Timothy 224. Yeah. And that wouldn't be necessary apart from original sin, because if we were just if we were um, morally neutral agents and, and could freely choose to serve God or reject him as Adam originally was, he, he had he, Adam had the freedom to, to choose to serve God or rebel against mm. him. I don't believe that because of original sin, I don't believe that we have that ability. Mm. We're, we're born dead in our trespasses. And, it, and that's a theme that I think is just repeated throughout the scriptures. So I do think it's an important one. Mm, thank you for that. Uh, Israel, uh, thanks again for the super chat. He says, can anything be done about the university's rejection of young earth creationism? So on, you know, on a large scale, this is not, you know, this is not a position that is that is popular um, and is often ridiculed um, by folks in academia. Um, what can Christians do uh, to work against that and maybe give um, not at the expense of compromising God's word, of course. Right. But is there anything that um, Christians can do in the scientific arena that can kind of turn the tide in terms of how young earth creationism is perceived? Um, yes, I think we need to be more careful than we've been in the past. Um, I, I don't endorse all young earth creationists. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have some great friends that I would endorse at Answers in Genesis, for example. And I mentioned Nathaniel Jeanson earlier, or Dr. Georgia Purdom, Dr. David Minton, uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, brilliant scientists. And I think they're doing very good work. And I think that's the kind of thing we need to be doing. We need to be doing uh, good quality scientific research. Mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to teach students to think logically as young, start them as young as you can. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I actually um, uh, wrote a curriculum uh, for an introduction to logic that's designed for junior high or high schoolers. And, and boy, if, if students could think logically, that would help when they went to universities. But in terms of the universes themselves, we're seeing a, a, a cascade effect where um, because you reject, and it's not just young earth creation, they reject the Bible in its entirety, uh, but especially Genesis, they reject Genesis. You lose Genesis 8.22, you, you lose your basis for induction, you lose your basis for the scientific method, um, you lose your basis for morality. Uh, I don't have a lot of hope for secular universities these days. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, the, the wheels of justice turn slowly, but my, my guess is they will eventually go out of existence because they're just not, they're not useful uh, unless you're teaching things uh, from a Christian worldview where knowledge is possible because we're made in the image of God and we have reliable senses and so on. So I'm not sure that anything can be done about the secular university's rejection, but there are, fortunately, there are a handful of really solid um, uh, biblical universities that teach biblical creation. I'm actually adjunct faculty at the master's uh, university. That's a really good school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I um, teach an astronomy class there every now and then we've, we've had to kind of postpone it a little bit because of the, all the shutdowns and so on. But uh, mm. uh, that's the way to look at it. And I, and I think that be, students that get education at good, solid Bible teaching universities like masters that have great, they got a great, they got great faculty there. I, I, I know most of the PhD scientists there and they're good folks and they have a heart for Jesus. And when you, when you approach science that way, uh, God will bless you with, with results. And I, and I think the world in the future will see that, 
uh, those students who are thinking as Christians end up becoming very productive members of society. And I, and I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I just kind of secular universities, the way they are, they can't endure forever. They can't mm. because they're undermining themselves. Sure. They, the, the secular humanist, humanistic worldview has the seeds of its own destruction built into it. And so they can't endure forever. Hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Scott, uh, Scott Terry says, I'm outraged that Dr. Lyle doesn't have a telescope in the background. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How dare you? I've got okay, one so, in my closet. So, so, so there's a conversation in the in the chat about uh, God, whether he used uh, 24 hour days or long periods of time. And someone makes a comment here. Maybe you could speak to this. Uh, conservative Christian says, uh, why would you constrain speaking to another commenter? Why would you constrain uh, God? How do you know what scripture do you use to support God needs longer than a day? So they have you have this idea of people uh, saying that God used, you know, longer periods. You even have Dr. Ross. Uh, he made mention of, well, this is required for this this effect to happen. And this is what you see what I'm saying. So they, they'll say something to the effect that it had to be longer because otherwise these processes wouldn't work. How would you speak to that? I would say God can do what he wants. And so let's take him at his word. If it, G, you know, Jesus turned water into wine and he did that apparently instantly or nearly so. Now, we wouldn't look at the text and say, well, you know, water can be turned into wine. Grapes do that. That's not all that spectacular. But we know it takes several, you know, it takes a period of time to do that. So mm -hmm. really, we need to reinterpret that text. God can do quickly what in, in nature would take a long time. And by the way, God's in control of nature anyway. So sure. it's just that it's just that the way God the way God maintains his creation is not necessarily the way he he created it. The way God preserves his creation and the way he, he, he spoke things into existence, he's not doing that today. He's not creating new animal kinds. He mm -hmm. did that at the beginning. And so, yeah, there's there's no there's no reason to say, well, no, God has to work within within uh, the natural processes that he's using today. He may choose to do so, but he's not required to do that. And so sure. when the Bible gives us examples of God doing things that um, he's not doing today, like speaking new things into existence, we should take him at his word. Mm -hmm. And if he tells us he did that in six days, we should take we should take him at his word there, too. Hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Kenny Johnson says the Big Bang inflation occurring now is observable by astronomy. There's some reification going there. Uh, mm -hmm. Astronomy enables us to see into the past uh, the further we view out into the universe. How would you uh, uh, how would you respond to that? Well, no, inflation is not observable. Uh, it's inflate. The idea of inflation is the, the idea that the universe when the Big Bang first popped into existence and it's starting to expand, it expands at a much accelerated rate and then drops back down to the regular rate. And they do that to try and get around the flatness problem, the monopole problem, mm -hmm. uh, several other problems that the Big Bang has. Uh, but no, we don't observe inflation. Uh, astro some astronomers observe certain patterns that they see in the cosmic microwave background that they interpret as being consistent with inflation, but we don't observe inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not something that we can see. We can't see the universe ballooning out at a at a accelerated rate. So that's, that's just not, that's just not the case. I'm not sure where, where he's getting that information. And again, the idea of seeing us seeing into the past, that's only the case if you define uh, the past, if you define time in a way that was very different than the way Bible, the Bible does and the way our ancestors did the Einstein synchrony convention, you can do that. Um, but again, if you use the anisotropic synchrony convention, we're seeing the universe in real time. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that, I came up with that's something that Einstein wrote about. Uh, it's it's been mentioned by other secular um, astronomers and physicists like Sarkar and Stachel. There's even a YouTube video on it, which I think, which is actually accurate. And it's, the funny thing is, when there's this YouTube video, where, you know, we, we talks about the fact you can't measure the one-way speed of light, and a lot of people are saying, "Well, how about that?" You know, well, I've been saying that for for decades, and it's, you know, it's like, well, now that it's on YouTube, <laughs> well, you can believe it. <laughs> it's been fact checked. Hey, YouTube is a scholarly source. So I, I mean, I love YouTube. You got, I, I learn, I learn most of my stuff through YouTube University. That is where to go. There's some great stuff there. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I get the tongue, the tongue in cheek there. Uh, okay, so this is a controversial question. Okay, I hope it's not. I hope it's not too personal, and you don't have to answer it. Uh, so, question: Please settle the the debate. Is Jason a Calvinist? <laughs> no judgment uh, here. Yes, you're a Calvinist. Yes. Five, full full blown five pointer. Yes. Okay. All right. He's like, it's, it's you know, I, I speak to all kinds of different churches, and it's not something I make a huge deal out of, but that's the way I understand the script. I'm, I'm reformed. I like reformed. That's awesome. All right. Yep. Uh, so let's see here. This is a question by Scott Terry. Uh, as an amateur stargazer, has anyone written, say, a guide to the night <laughs> sky? That would be amazing. Is that something you've? I've made. Thank that you for that. That 
Easy promotion. Yes. I, <laughs> I, I've written a book called Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, and that's exactly what it is. It's just to help you to enjoy. It's not an apologetics book, really. It's just to help you enjoy the night sky, but it is written from a Christian perspective, okay. and it does have the gospel in it because I, I'm hoping that some people will pick it up and read it and as they enjoy uh, God's majesty, as they enjoy um, uh, God's natural revelation, that they will be saved by God's special revelation, his, his mm -hmm. gospel message. All right. Uh, finding truth uh, is another debate related thing. Uh, so Dr. Lyle thinks that only PhDs are qualified to have a good discussion. I think I could answer that for you. I think you believe non PhDs can have good discussions, but you have a rule of thumb that you want to stick to. And that's your own personal conviction. I think that's yeah. fair. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if somebody, you know, there, there might be somebody who's, who's really brilliant on these issues, but mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I don't have the time to go through and, and research all that. If it, debates take a long time to, to really research your opponent's position and I don't want, I'm sorry, but I don't want to get some 16 year old who thinks he knows everything. And in fact, doesn't have a clue. I just don't want to be drawn into that situation. And I do. Ask, oh, but what if he's in his twenties? He's not 16. He's in his twenties. Right. <laughs> PhD. The, the idea of a PhD is you've demonstrated, you have to demonstrate to a team of other PhD, in mm -hmm. this case, scientists that, you know, what you're talking about. You have to sh show competency of the scientific method and make a new discovery that nobody's made. And that, that, that gives you a certain credibility that uh, can, can non PhDs discover new stuff in science. Of course, that's, that's not the issue. It's just that the, um, the, the PhD, it just kind of show, it kind of demonstrates that they, that they have done that hopefully. Right. Uh, although again, as universities go downhill, mm -hmm. that, that may become a null. See, the reality is there are a number, I, I respect you and I love the, the work that you put out. There are a number of people who don't have PhDs that I would love to see you have a debate with, oh, but I respect the fact that you have your own, reasoning right look at dr craig as well there are certain people that he just won't debate it'd be it'd be interesting it'd be great i wish he debated some folks on certain topics that i think are important but i think um we have to be very careful and i'm not saying that folks are doing this um but as awesome as debates are i listen to a lot of them um we need to be very careful that we don't egg on debates for fleshly purposes because i know a lot of people like to see these sorts of things for like oh i really want to see this person against that person and you know they kind of get in that mindset and um and i get it I resonate with that. Um, but I think if someone holds a position like, Hey, this is what I want to do. And this is, this is where I draw my line. I think we should respect that. Um, all right. So that's my, my little, my little throwing in my, my two cents. Uh, all right. All right. Well, um, I think that's the last one. There are a couple of repeats with the, you know, issues of debates and things like that. Dr. Lyle, I want to thank you so much, not just for tonight, but every time you've been on the show multiple times and um, I know that you're a very busy man. And so I greatly appreciate you taking the time to talk about these important topics. Oh, happy to be on. Thanks for having me on. And by some act of providence, if I'm able to contact Dr. Craig, I'd love to have you guys have a, a great, respectful, moderated conversation because I know both of you guys are gentlemen. Um, so who knows? Maybe I'll reach out to someone. We'll see. Maybe he'll find the time. Um, that'd be interesting. So um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your questions, your comments, your super chats. Um, I am uh, immensely grateful for those. And um, if you like the content here, be sure to um, subscribe, share the content, and uh, thank you so much for your support. That's it for this episode. And Dr. Lyle, is there any last thing you'd like to say? Uh, I have a series of articles on William Lane Craig, and next one's coming out tomorrow. So you might check that out at the biblical, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. All right. And, and are there any you for having me on? Appreciate it. No problem. And are there any books you want to you want to just kind of advertise for two seconds that you think folks will okay. understanding Genesis? This this deals with a lot of the stuff that that um, it, it wasn't tailored to Craig, but it deals with a lot of stuff. It, deal, it does deal with your us in, in sure, some detail. Sure, so. sure. Now, yeah, my, fav my favorite Jason Lyle moment. Um, do you have any sources that can uh, that you can point to uh, that can speak to this issue? And you're like. <laughs> <laughs> it's called the bible and it is um written by god um <laughs> that's a bestseller it's really great it is a bestseller <laughs> highly researched all right thank you so much dr lyle and thank you everyone else for listening in that's it for this episode take care god bless bye-bye